what we want to do today is cover some of the basics of MVC uh, and talk through what that is and talk through how routing works because MVC doesn't actually help anybody do anything unless you actually have routing. And so um, like what we discussed in the first time, if you weren't here for that, the plan for all of these series for the next probably five months or six months after this one um, is that we will always begin from a Rails new perspective. So the idea is that you have all the prerequisites to kick up a Rails application, but you may not have, uh, you, you, we're not gonna start with any like pre-built application and add on to it. We're gonna try to go from the basics up. And so if that changes, we'll, we'll make note of it, but for the most part, the, the pattern will be, we'll start with Rails new and then we'll move from there. And so assuming that you have a machine, like the one that I have is a virtual machine, that has all the re prerequisites to run a Rails application, uh, we'll just kind of kick off. And so um, that's what I'm gonna do first. I'm gonna do Rails new. I'm gonna skip a couple of things, partly because they cause problems, especially if you're destroying applications and creating them quickly. Spring is one of those things. It tends to aggressively cache things and sometimes that breaks uh, development environments when you're creating and destroying Rails applications. Um, I'm also going to skip tests for now. and this video will be on the internet, so I can't disavow it, but I would never do this on a production application. I just want to kind of keep focused on the things that we're going to cover today, which is MVC and routing. Uh, I think that might be the only things that I wanted to skip this time. So we're going to create an application, um, and it's going to be called MVC routing. And so this Rails new command is basically saying, skip a couple of things that I don't think are relevant for the discussion, and then you give it the name of the application that you want to create. So I'm going to call that and it's creating a whole bunch of Rails. Um, it's, it's creating all the boilerplate for a new Rails application. It will likely be a little bit slower for you if you do this the first time, um, just because in order to get all of these dependencies installed, it'll have to download them and some of them have to compile natively. So if you run into something where it seems like it's just moving slower than mine, uh, that that is kind of to be expected. As with most web applications these days, you can't really get away from using JavaScript, so it's also installing some JavaScript dependencies. And did I? What did I name that? Oh, I called it skip tests. That doesn't seem right. Maybe it was skip test. Let me do. Let me run that command again with help and see what I did wrong. By the way, one of the things that we're encouraging is mistakes. So you'll see me make a lot of them and that's okay. Um, if you have any questions about the mistakes or you run into any of your own, just ask questions. Uh, this, this is not supposed to be a fully polished. Tim is an experienced Rails developer, so he's never gonna make any mistakes. I wanna display to you and show to you that I make mistakes probably at least as often as anybody else. <laughs> And so uh, this is sort of a minimal preparation, but maximum learning kind of an opportunity here. So what I believe I did is I made it tests and it should have been test singular. And so it created an application called skip tests, which is not what I would like for it to do. So I'm gonna run that again. While that's happening, cause it'll take another 30 seconds. Um, does anybody have any questions so far? I'll take that as a no. Yep, I'll be pinging you, Tim, if uh, questions come up in chat. But all right, all, all, right. all quiet on the Western front so far. Cool. Um, so one of the other things as it's doing this that will come up from what we're going to approach today is that uh, it's going to generate some active record models, and that's the object relational mapper that talks to the database in Rails. That's the default way that you communicate with the database. We're not covering that today. Actually, Bill's been kind enough to, to uh, volunteer to do active record next month. So where we see that, I'll call attention to it and I'll basically defer that until later because I wanna avoid coupling talking about how things get shown on the screen and routed from how things get put in the database and retrieved from the database. Um, so just as a heads up on that. Okay. So I'm in the application that I just created called MVC Routing. 
And what I want to do now, uh, ju just to kind of keep things clean and uh, keep things so that we can kind of look through the changes that get made as we as we progress through this, is I actually am going to look at the Git status. Um, if you're not familiar with version control right now, that's totally okay. Um, but what I'm going to do is basically just add all the files that were just created when I called Rails new to an initial commit. So I'm just going to like get those out of the queue of changes that have been made. And I'll show you why, why I did that here in just a minute. But when I run status right now, basically I've committed all the code. I don't have any changes that I want to be able to look through. So what we have right now is a Rails application. And so I can run Rails server. It's going to boot up Puma, which is the Rails, the, it's the Rack application server that Rails runs on top of. Um, Rack and Rails are interchangeable in a lot of ways, but Rack is actually like a lower level thing that Rails uses to serve requests to a browser. And I'll go visit uh, the localhost 3000, and I get the really welcoming, friendly message that says, yay, you're on Rails, and tells you some information about what versions you're running and things like that. So that is basically the first step, is we have a running Rails application. It doesn't do much. It does the same thing that everybody else's Rails new is going to work on in the, in the world, and you don't have anything special going on. However, this is where we start diving into MVC. So if I want to, you've probably seen this in Rails, if I want to do something meaningful, there are a lot of different helpers that you can call on the command line to help you generate a bunch of code to be very productive very quickly. Um, in fact, a lot of other web frameworks kind of took Rails approach and pulled that into their style. I think Spring Boot is probably the best example I can think of is they kind of came along after Rails had all the generators and they built it for Java the same way. Um, so if I want to create something somewhat meaningful today, just as an example, let's create the dumbest Twitter clone we've ever seen. <laughs> How about that? Um, and so I'm going to use the scaffolding is what it's called that, that Rails generates in order to kind of get something very quickly. And then we can kind of go back and look at what it generated, what it's doing, and where the different pieces of the application are. So I'm going to use the scaffolding, which is a generator. So I'm going to call Rails generate scaffold. I need to give it a name for the thing that I'm generating scaffolding for. So it's going to be a tweet. And I need to tell it, go ahead. Sorry, Tim, I was going to interject. Um, I'm having a little difficulty on my end, and I wonder if others will, or some may when they view this video, seeing the commands you're typing at the bottom of the screen. Oh, sure. Let Is me, it, uh, I mean, a habit we could get into to clear the screen so that new commands appear at the top or let me see yeah if maybe I can there you go yeah that'll this. that'll preserve history so we can scroll how about that yeah, that's that, perfect thank okay. you tim great yeah and also if you can increase the font size oh boy i had to do that last time and i forgot how to do it <laughs> here let me see if i can get there from preferences that would be good shortcuts These will be good notes for us for future. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they, absolutely. You know, font bump on Ubuntu Terminal Web. Yeah. I think you can uh, just uh, Command Plus. Command Plus. OK, I tried that, but um, well, I'm inside of Linux. I wonder if, oh, okay, I got it. It's, it was control shift plus for me this time. Um, how far do I need to go? Is that good? Perfect, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, thank okay, you. Okay, okay. Okay, so I'm getting back to the command that I was running. It's Rails generate scaffold, which will generate a whole bunch of things in order to support the creation of a new screen and model inside the application. And I'll kind of dive into the details of the distinction there. Um, but Rails generate scaffold tweet, and then I need to give it some fields of what I want it to actually generate. Um, so what should a tweet actually have? Um, for this, I'm just going to say, how about username? And it's going to be a string. And then it'll have a message. And I don't think we need to get a whole lot more complicated than that in our 
in our structure for this data. So um, what I'm telling it to do is generate me everything that I need in order to serve up and save a bunch of different tweets in the application. So I'm gonna hit enter on this and it'll show you a whole list of different things that it has saved or that it has changed in the file system. So we'll just watch this happen. Okay, so if I look at those changes, just from like the files that changed, um, it created this thing called a migration. We'll cover that in the active record thing next month. So don't worry too much about that. It created this special model file called tweet.rb. Uh, that seems pretty important. It created a resource route, which will also be important for us. And then it created a controller. So we've got a model, we have a route, and we have a controller so far. And then we have a whole bunch of views. And so that's this is basically the MVC and the routing files that get created. There's some other things for JSON endpoints and for style and things like that, but we're not gonna cover those. It's really these pieces right here that we're gonna talk about today. So let's kind of dig into that. And first let's kind of see what it did. So Rails, when it generates something called a migration, we need to run it. Again, we're not gonna really cover that today, so I'm not gonna spend too much time dwelling on it, but I'm gonna call Rails DB migrate. And it's just gonna change the database structure a little bit to support saving these things. Okay. And then I'm gonna run the Rails server. We just did this a little bit ago, but there are changes now. And when I've run this server, we're gonna see something new. So because I created a model and all the structure and scaffolding for something called a tweet, then I can go to an endpoint called tweets. And it gives me a whole bunch of what's called CRUD views. And uh, I always forget what the U stands for, update, I guess. So there's create, some read, update, delete, I think is what that stands for. But basically what Rails gives me with the scaffolding is the ability to very quickly manage tweets in all the ways that you could manage it by creating them, editing them, updating them, deleting them. Um, and so I'm just gonna kind of show you what that boilerplate looks like from an experience perspective. I go to tweets and the first thing I see is a list of tweets. But because I don't have any tweets, it's all blank and kind of sad looking. So let's look at this new tweet button. We're gonna click on that. And if you notice, it's got the two fields that I told it on the command line. I told it username and message are important. So if I were to create a new tweet here, I would use my username and I would say this, uh-oh. Did I stop sharing? Yeah, apparently. That's <laughs> really interesting. Okay, hang on just a second. I just yep. saw Zoom like pop back up. Yep. Okay. Am I back to Sorry, we had a we yeah, yeah. We had a new uh um someone new join. So okay. I, I clicked the link, maybe I accidentally also unshared you. Apologies there. No worries at all. Okay. So I'm going to create my very first tweet in this application that's going to take over the world. Uh, and I click create. And now I'm back on, well, now I'm on a view page for this. But if I go back to that first page we were on, you can see that it's now kind of saved and persisted this thing that is a tweet. And it says this is the first tweet. So if I click on new tweet again, I could create a second one. And now I've got kind of just a view page again that shows, that shows me that it was created successfully and there's a message, this is the best tweet. And if I go back, I go back to this list page again and here I have these two, right? I've got the first tweet and I've got the best tweet. Well, maybe I didn't like that first tweet very much and so Rails is kind enough to generate this destroy link for me and I can click it. It's got a little bit of JavaScript in there that says, you know, make sure that the user really wants to do this before they, before they actually destroy it. I click that and then that first tweet just disappears. And so you're kind of seeing like, this is all boilerplate. This was a single command that we ran that gave us all of these things. Uh, it gave us this list view. It gave us the ability to look at one individual tweet. It gave us the ability to edit them. I didn't try that yet. I'll put an extra couple of exclamation points and then accidental one on there. And now I, you can see that I've change the message, which you can't do on Twitter. See, I've already got a feature that Twitter doesn't have. <laughs> and so you have edit, you have show, you have index, and now there's a destroy. And I'll just go ahead and destroy that last one. 
and we're basically back to where we started from. So that that is basically what you get out of the out of the box as a user experience from Rails when you do the, the scaffolding, when you use generated scaffolds. Um, so let's kind of dig in a little bit to what that code looks like. And then what we're gonna do right after that is we're gonna create that from scratch and try to try to see what that experience looks like without um, without having the generated scaffolding to support us. So we'll take away the safety net for a second and, and just kind of look behind the scenes of what's going on there. Um, I have VS Code. I haven't gone through like how to install this. I'm kind of assuming that if you need help with that, we might make another video for that. But VS Code is just a way for us to kind of all look at the source code together and, and come to the same conclusions together or, or ask questions. So it's just an editor. You can probably use whatever editor that you want. But if you do want to use VS Code, um, we can help you with that. Um, so as I go into this, uh, the reason that I like VS Code for this is that I can do the same thing that I did on the, on the terminal there, and I can see all the changes of all the files that have been created or modified. Um, so let's just go one by one through this. Um, the way that Rails works is, as a request from a browser comes into Rails as a server, it needs to know how to route that to the right place. So you can have a very large application, a Rails application, um, and you always need to be able to know from any request that the browser makes to that server, that real server that's running, how do, you, how do you structure your code so that you can handle that particular request the right way. Um, so Rails has this thing called a router. And so if you look at the changes that it makes when, when you generate scaffolding for a new resource, it will add a new line for that in the router. So this is under the config folder, and there's a routes.rb file. And it creates that when you call Rails new, it just, this, this is like the directory of all the places that the application can serve a request for. So if you wanna see how that, I, I should probably do a font bump here, right? Yeah. Um, so if you wanna see how that relates to the browser, you notice that when I went to the URL tweets, that was the initial index page that we received. That's what this resource tweets does. Um, and so it basically says, okay, I know how to handle a request. If somebody goes to this endpoint on the, on the browser, then that's how I get there. This resource is actually kind of, um, it's kind of a shortcut for a bunch of different routes. But if we wanted to kind of play around with like what that actually looks like, we would probably do something like, I've got tweets and I want to route that to, and I always forget exactly what this looks like. I think it's tweets. Um, index. And let me see if I can get a better view of this since we're not looking at the changes anymore. So let me open that file up directly. Okay, so this resources tweets generates a whole bunch of different routes. Um, but the one that we look at first is called the index page. And so that that me going in the browser to slash tweets is the equivalent of doing this, but resources takes that takes care of that for me. So we'll kind of cover this a little bit more in detail when we get to that. But just know that there's like some magic going on behind this resources link um, that generates all the CRUD, all the create and update and delete links that we have already visited in the browser. It just does that automatically for us without us having to think about it too much. Hey, Tim, is it too much of a distraction to run uh, Rails routes in oh, sure. the terminal to show yeah. which ones it generated? That's a great idea. Let's do that. Uh, just got to figure out how to get a new window. <laughs> there we go. Oh. All right, um, so there, there are a bunch of command line utilities that Rails gives you. Routes is one of them. And when you run Rails routes, you can actually see how Rails is going to take requests in from the browser and send them on to something else. Um, I might need to take the font phone back off a little bit for this. It's very, very noisy. Rails conductor, action mailbox, okay. This first set of things is the things that we really care about. So by having, by having resources tweets in that config routes, it actually generated all of these. So it generated a git at the index page, which lists all the tweets. It generated a post route. So if the browser posts to the same uh, tweets URL, then it will actually call the create method. So we have to have some way of creating tweets. So there's gotta be some code to support that. Um, there's new, there's edit, show, update, and there's destroy. These patch and put 
or update are essentially synonyms for each other, but it's trying to be, it's trying to follow the resourceful kind of restful approach that the internet, uh, that, that HTTP was sort of built on, um, that we've just hacked about <laughs> as developers and, and reconditioned ourselves to understand over time. But um, if you've heard the term restful before, Rails attempts to by default be restful. Um, and so you'll see all these routes generated as a result of that. So if you wanna do a little bit of research um, in between now and the next time we meet, search restful endpoints or restful uh, applications and you'll be able to kind of see a little bit of the reason why all of these things are here. So getting back to this, now we know that there's a route that says resources tweets. And so we know if we visit tweets, it's gonna go somewhere. We don't know where that's gonna go yet, we just know it's gonna go somewhere. So let's start looking through that. Uh, the first time that Rails gets a request and starts to dispatch it and it looks at this routing, it's going to go to a controller. And so if you kind of want to think about it like this, it goes from browser to router to controller. So for every place that you have in your router, you need to have a controller that handles that thing as well. So let's just kind of step back for a second and take away the resources tweets and just think about only the case where we want to list some of the tweets out on a page. And that's the essential equivalent of this. We want to say every time that somebody visits tweets, I want to show them a list of all the tweets. They won't be able to do anything else to see all of them. And in order to do that, Rails has a naming convention for all of the files that go in a Rails application. Most of the things that you deal with are under the app folder. And so if we go and look at the app folder, of this Rails application, you'll see a whole bunch of other folders underneath it. But this first one that I want to look at is called controllers. So inside controllers, when we use that scaffolding, we said, okay, generate me a tweet, and that tweet should have, you know, all the all the resourceful, all the restful endpoints that you can do. So if we open up tweets controller, you're going to see a whole bunch of code. I would like to just get rid of all this code for now and only focus on the index. So we're just going to delete. I think all of this should be good. Okay. It, it's it's kind enough to tell you, if you open up a scaffolded generated controller, it's kind enough to tell you how to get to that thing, <laughs> which is really helpful. It didn't used to do that. That's more of a recent thing. Um, but we're just gonna make this thing as simple as we possibly can. So when we visit the index, page, which is just slash tweets, all that it's doing is this one line of code. It's saying this variable called tweets with an at sign in front of it equals tweet.all. And that might seem a little bit cryptic, um, but if you kind of want to think logically about it and you look at it, 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 it kind of makes sense that it's just saying, give me all of the tweets and put it into this tweets variable. Does that make sense? Or is there is there any confusion about what I'm saying so far? I can't tell if I'm going fast or slow. Give me a thumbs perfect. up. Perfect. Yeah, go ahead. Absolutely perfect. Okay, great. Um, so basically what we're saying is store into this tweets variable. We have no idea where this tweets variable go is going yet, but store into this tweets variable tweet.all, which I, you can kind of make the assumption I'm going to load up all the tweets in the database. Not great for performance if you have millions of them. Right now we have zero, so it's probably okay. Um, but that's our tweets controller. So now we have the browser request coming into slash tweets and then going into a router that says, okay, I have these resources called tweets. So somewhere there's a controller called the tweets controller that must handle this. And we've defined this index method that if you look at the routes file, matches directly with this tweets hash index. And so you can kind of see where the flow is going. You've got a browser, you've got the router, you've got the controller, but now what? Well, if we go back to that controller file, there is this reference to this thing called tweet that we haven't really talked about. We talked about the file, the model file that it created, but we haven't really talked about where tweet comes from. Tweet is actually a class. And so let's go look at the model class for tweet. So we've got tweets controller. One of the other things that the scaffolding generates is called tweet.rb. So if we open this up, oh boy, there's nothing in here. <laughs> All that we really have is a class called tweet and it has this less than sign and this application record. 
well, the less than sign says I'm of this class type, or this is my super class. Um, I won't get into the details too much of that, but basically you can think about this like a tweet is a, is a kind of application record. And application record is that active record stuff that Bill's gonna cover later. So we basically just have this little model class hanging out here that does some magic behind the scenes and knows that it has a couple of fields on it. Um, and, but when we look at the controller, we're saying, give me all the tweets. This tweet, because it is an application record kind of a thing, knows how to go and fetch all of itself from the database and it brings all that back. There's a little too much magic here and we'll kind of back away from this when we do it from scratch and we won't use active record just so that we can kind of see everything behind the scenes. Um, but that's our controllers and that's our model. And then I wanna to touch on views really quick and then talk about the separation of concerns, like the reason why you would have an M, a V and a C because it might seem like there's a little bit too much ceremony here, like too much separation of things. And I wanna kind of address that very quickly at the end of this. So inside of views, we have this tweets folder. This is also automatically generated. Uh, you know what I would like to do right now is I kind of just want to delete. Uh, I want to delete all the files that we're not really looking at right now because I really just want to look at the index workflow right now. So I'll delete all these other files the hard way so you can see how uh, manual labor intensive I am. <laughs> but actually what we have now is just this index.html.erb. And there's a naming convention here. Um, if you've got a route called tweets and you've got a controller called the tweets controller and it has a method called index, by default, after it does all of the stuff inside that method, it needs to show the browser something, right? You need to return something to the browser that you can see. And so what it does right after that, by default, is it'll go and look in the views folder on, under the folder for the thing that you asked for. So in this case, tweets and it'll look for something called the same thing as the method with .html and .erb at the end. .html, you probably already know, that's just gonna look like an HTML file. If the whole application was just static HTML, uh, you could just write regular HTML in these files and you'd be done. The .erb basically says, I'm, I'm also going to every once in a while need to put some Ruby code in here that gets evaluated as I'm sending this response back to the, to the browser. And so if we go look at this, you can see 90, maybe 95% of this file is just straight HTML. There's not a whole lot going on here, tables and T heads and TRs. And so uh, if you're familiar with HTML from other projects or other frameworks that you've used, all of that still applies and will always apply because you're doing, you're doing web development here. Um, one of the things that it generates as part of the scaffolding is this table for the index page. And so you've got a username, you've got a message, You've got this third column, which it doesn't have a class or anything, but this is the actions column. So this would be where we saw that edit or update or delete. Um, and then as we go down here, we see something really interesting. So this is that Ruby code that gets mixed into the HTML. Um, if, you, if you're looking at this right here, you're probably seeing this is kind of familiar. So we've got this at tweets and we've got this at tweets. And so, What's going on here is that when a controller handles a request, anything that it stores in an at variable, um, in other parts of Ruby, you would call that an instance variable. And that's pretty much the way that this applies as well. This variable is available anywhere within that tweets controller. So if we were to define another method and start referencing that at tweets, as long as it was defined here, we could use it somewhere else as well. And so this is kind of, I'm trying to think of what this would, a good way to describe this other than that. Um, if you need me to do that, I can spend a little bit more time doing it. But one way to just think about this is that because we define this as an at variable, as at tweets here, we're able to then turn around and use that in the views directly. So this has already been defined as all the tweets. So the Ruby syntax here is saying, okay, for each of the tweets, I want to do something. And so this syntax says each tweet do this and basically we're saying give me a reference to each tweet as I iterate over it so that I can show something on the screen or process it in some way. So everything inside this area right here is going to happen once for each tweet that's in the database. So we're going to show a TR and then we're going to show a TD with the username and then another TD with the message and then we're going to have these other links for show edit and destroy. 
Does that all make sense or is there anything else that I should dig into a little bit more for that? All right, cool. Um, and that's- Still here. Uh, yeah, go ahead. No, I just said good. That's absolutely good. Okay, great. Um, and so that's essentially the M, the V, and the C. And the reason that there's a separation or a difference between those um, might be best, I might, I might be able to, to do the best job of explaining why, why that separation is important uh, if I were just going to write an application. PHP gets beat up a lot about it um, because it's so easy to write just one PHP file that does everything. Uh, you can do the same thing in Sinatra or any other sort of Rails kind of framework in Ruby as well, but you can clump everything together, right? Like you could write one file that goes and looks stuff up in the database and runs queries, and then you could assemble the data the way that you want to see it, and then you could put it into a template and return a big string just like this HTML, all from the same file if you really wanted to. Um, the reason that MVC came about is that you don't necessarily want to couple all of those things together. Like I don't want the way that I'm showing a particular page information, like you might be on the index page, the way that I show a summary version of each tweet on the index page shouldn't be so tightly coupled to the database that if I make any changes at all to tweet that it breaks my index page. Because if you start thinking about bigger and bigger applications, if every rendering of every page to the browser required a, an intimate connection of all the or an intimate knowledge of all the details all the way back into the database then your application would be very very brittle and you're tying different concerns together right as a user i want to see pertinent information on a screen on the web browser only at the times that i want to see it and nothing more and so if i'm just showing everything or fetching everything from tweet all the time all and showing it everywhere, then I've, then I've got a problem. And so they came up with the MV, MVC mark architecture in order to separate out some of the pieces that shouldn't really be related to each other that closely. And so kind of going back to that, the M is the domain model. So the M in this case is, this is the essence of the thing that I'm trying to do. I'm not actually building a Rails application most of the time, I'm solving a problem. And so the M is really, how am I solving this problem? How do I think about the world? How do I model the real world with code? That all belongs essentially in the M. So when I'm thinking about it from the controller's perspective, there's an orchestration of events that needs to happen. And so if I'm thinking about it like that, uh, I know that the router is going to send me a request. I know that I need to talk to tweet somehow. I need to go get some information from this domain model over here that's solving a problem for me. And then there's something that has to happen in order for me to get that data to the browser and the way that it needs to be presented to them. And that's where the view comes in. And so the view is really like a picture into the domain model that the controller has orchestrated so that as a user opening up a web browser, I see the right information at the right time. How was that explanation? Does that make sense? Is there anything I could drill down into a little bit more? By the way, MVC took me about a month as a developer reading every day about to understand, and this was early on for me as a developer in my, in my career. So I know that this isn't like a very natural concept immediately. Is there anything that I could help to, to make this clearer? Okay, I will take that as, things are going okay or you're so lost that maybe we just need to follow up in a different conversation. Either one of those is totally okay. <laughs> um, so that's kind of the idea. So I open a web browser, I make a request, goes through a router, goes to a controller. That controller goes and fetches stuff from a model and then puts it into a view that presents the data exactly the way that I want to as a user. And so uh, we've seen a lot of magic from Rails. We saw that one line of code that, or that one line command that we ran created all of this stuff. And I wanna take some of that magic away so that you see exactly how that works. So what I'm gonna do now is go back to the terminal and essentially reset to where we were before I ran that command. Um, there's a couple ways to do that, but because I did an initial commit, I can actually just reset this. Actually, I'll do it a different way. Um, for every generator that Rails gives you, it also gives you 
uh, a destroy. So most of the time you just run the exact same command with destroy instead of generate, and it'll undo all the things that it did in order to support what you did. This may or may not work because I've deleted a bunch of files and changed some stuff, but we'll see how it goes. So I'm gonna call rails destroy cat scaffold tweet. I'll give it the fields and I'll just run it. Okay. And if I run get status, I still do have a couple of things going on, which is interesting. Um, I'll just clean those things up manually. The DB schema is fine. I'm gonna go look at that config routes because I changed it. Uh, so I wanna make sure that I get that updated. Okay, so I will delete these two lines. Okay. And now we are essentially back to where we started. You know, I'll just go ahead and delete this schema.rb as well. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that I'm gonna run into some problems because of that, but <laughs> sometimes it's fun to play around and, and see what breaks. Okay, so if I try to close down my Rails server and restart it, Let's scoot this back up on the screen so you can see it again. Okay. If I start my real server back up, it's now listening on port 3000 just like it was before. And let's just try to go to this tweet's URL and see what happens. Uh-oh. Okay, so if you saw that Rails routes that we did earlier, this is another version of that. You can just see basically everything that, uh, every route that's available. And you can actually search for things. So I can like look in here and say, are there any tweets? There are not, and that's sad. Okay, I'm okay with that. <laughs> if we go back to the main page, we're still on Rails. So everything here is basically right back to where we were. Let's work through an example in the time that we have left of creating the model, the view, and the controller without all the scaffolding. So the first thing that we're gonna do, and we're gonna do this, we'll do this with browser feedback. We'll do browser-driven development instead of test-driven development, just to make this a little bit more interesting. Um, if I start out and I create the route, let's just say that's the first thing I need to do anyway. I'm just going to create the route to get to tweets and assume that we'll get to where we need to from there. And this is one of the things that Rails really supports well, is that you can iteratively create things and it'll tell you what the next thing is that you need to do. And so I'll go into config. Did I delete routes? No, but you have it open there on the right tab. Yeah. Okay. Why isn't it here in the config? Oh, it's just it's down. down. Yeah. Okay. My scrolling is a little bit weird, and I thought I was scrolling, and I wasn't. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to say, give me an index page for tweets, and route that to the tweets controller, and call the index method on it when you get there. So I'll save that. It says, I can't do that. I'm going to overwrite it anyway. <laughs> okay, so this one thing should let me now go back and do slash tweets. Let's see what the let's see what it tells me. Uh oh. This isn't maybe the nicest message, but it is an interesting message. It says uninitialized constant tweets controller. Does anybody have an idea what that means? Anybody can speak up, and if not, then I'll just answer it, but I don't want to. I would imagine that the tweets controller does not exist, Tim. That's a, that's a pretty good call. So it's interesting because all I did was add that one line in the routes file, and it's saying, hey, you don't have a tweets controller constant. That a constant can be a bunch of different things in Rails, but one of the things that a constant is, or one thing that is a constant is a controller or a class. And so I'm gonna go ahead and just create that thing, and let's see if we can make it happy. So we're gonna spend the rest of the time, the couple minutes that we have left, basically just making Rails happy instead of expecting it to make us happy. How about that? So if I go into app and I go into controllers, I have a couple files here, but I definitely don't have that tweets controller anymore. So I'm gonna create a new file. And one of the conventions for controllers is that it's the plural version, which gets a little bit weird, but we're gonna ignore that kind of weirdness for now. We know that a tweet has, or that tweets are the plural of a tweet. So we're gonna do that. 
And this naming convention is the plural form of the thing we want, all lowercase underscore controller, and then dot rb. And when we create that, we'll have a blank file. I'm really happy that this editor didn't try to autocomplete a bunch of stuff for me, because that's not what I want. So I'll type all of this from scratch. We're creating a class, because a controller is a type of class. And we're going to say tweets controller. Now you notice over here in the file, it's all lowercase with an underscore in between. That's called snake casing. And over here, we're doing something called title casing or, or camel casing, but with the first one capitalized. So I'll create this class and it has to match that file name pretty much exactly, but with title casing. I'm gonna do this less than sign, which means it's a type of this other class that I'm gonna type. And it's an application controller. So this is a one of the application controllers that I have in my application. And then I just need to end that class. So right now we have a class called tweets controller. And this application controller is right here. You can see where I'm inheriting from that class and it's in the same folder that I'm in. So I save that file, that's all I'm gonna do. And what do you think is gonna happen? I'll give you a second to kind of guess what you're, you're gonna see here. I'm guessing it's gonna yell that there's no view. Ah, that's an interesting one. Okay, anybody else? Be an empty page. Be an There's empty no page. end point. There's no what? There's no end point for index. Okay, let's give it a shot here. Ah, it wasn't any of those things. Well, it might have been the last one. I, yeah. I wasn't sure exactly. The, the index endpoint, the method not being there. I'll, I'll yeah. give them that one. Yeah, so it's not that the view doesn't exist, although the view doesn't exist. Um, it's, it's that there is no action to handle it. And so if we go back over here, you'll see there is no index method. So let's create that. And that's all I'm gonna do. Just enough to make Rails a little bit more happy to tell us the next thing that we need to do. Okay, so now, I think Sarah, you're the one that said that there's no view. Now we're at a point where it's actually giving us really, really helpful information. I kind of wish they would do this all the way along and maybe they're working on it, but now you're seeing, okay, cool. You have an index, you have a tweets controller, but it's missing a template for the request format that you had, which is text HTML, because we're just hitting tweets. It's the equivalent essentially of like a, of, a, of an HTML request. And so there's a bunch of notes here. I'm not actually sure I've ever seen this before. Oh, it's telling you kind of where things need to go. Um, and I'll, I'll walk through that as well. So basically what we're saying right now is, okay, we're trying to show a list of the tweets, but for some reason we don't have any uh, template to be able to render for that. So we have the route and we have the controller. We don't have a model and we don't have a view yet. So let's, let's keep pushing on this a little bit. So what do you think the next thing is that I need to do? Like what folder do I need to be in next? I'm gonna guess views, Tim. Views it is, let's go there. <laughs> this is interesting because it says views slash layouts and I'm not sure exactly. Oh, oh, this is the layouts views. So this is a little bit of a weird thing in VS Code. Maybe it'll let me create one directly in views. Um, I want to create a folder inside of views and that folder is gonna be the name of the, of the resource that I'm trying to create. And so I've got a tweets folder now and then inside of that, if you remember the name of the file, it's gonna be index.html.erb. Okay, so now I have an HTML file and I'm gonna save it. And I'm gonna go back to the browser and reload it. What do you think is gonna happen this time? Blank page. Blank page. Look at that, we have a blank page. It's not actually exactly blank. If we go view the page source, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here. Uh, we'll get to that some other time, but it's really a layout that's like wrapping the content of the page that we have. All right, so we have our tweets index page. It doesn't do anything and that's kind of sad. So let's make it do something. Let's kind of go back to exactly the same thing that we saw the scaffolding make. Okay, so if I'm in my tweets controller, do you remember the code that was here? It was instance variable tweets equals tweet dot all. Let's just do that and let's see what happens. Maybe, maybe magically there's still some stuff left around from scaffold and it'll work. No, no, but we're back to this uninitialized constant, which is usually a good indicator that it can't find a class that we're looking for. 
And so it's looking for this thing called tweet. It's also inside the namespace of tweets controller. We'll ignore that part for now, but it's saying you don't have a tweet, but you're, you're trying to call tweet. And so let's go create that model the same way that we did before, but maybe with a slight tweak on it. We've got this models folder. We're gonna create the tweet. Again, this is sort of the naming convention. This is a singular, so it's just a tweet and it's all lowercase, dot rb. And we're going to say, this is a class called tweet, also title cased here. I'm not gonna inherit from active record because that's kind of, that's too deep for us right now. And I'm just gonna save this. So now I have a class called tweet that is our model. Doesn't have anything in it, doesn't know about anything else. And I'm just gonna reload the browser and see what it says now. Okay, cool. We've got this undefined method all for tweet class. So it found the tweet class and it knows now that we don't have anything called all. Let me create one. And here's where I'm gonna diverge a little bit from where we were before. Instead of, instead of creating a database and doing a bunch of migrations, I'm just going to create a couple of tweets and make this pretend like it's our database. And so I'm gonna just say, you know what, I need a tweet. which I don't need to do tweet.new, I can just call new. Um, and I will pass in, this is sort of me just projecting the kind of code or the kind of thing that I want it to be, but I'll pass in my username and I'll pass in a message. Now there's nothing in this code that knows anything about a username or a message. And so I'm, I, I'm gonna, just for the sake of simplifying things, um, I think I'm gonna make this into an open struct. Actually, I'm just going to, I, I wanna keep this as simple as I can. I'm just gonna call open struct.new. I think I can do that. And this is a way of saying, whatever I pass you just becomes like, a, almost like a JavaScript literal array or a hash. Um, just take what I give you and give it back to me. So let's try that and see what it does. Don't worry too much if OpenStruct seems a little bit scary. I don't think I saved this, or maybe I did. I wonder if it did not compile. We'll see, I'll try to reload it one more time and see what it does. Okay, I don't think it compiled. So sometimes you'll get an, a stale message. Uh, it that. totally, it totally did compile. There is no all method. Oh, what did I call on it on the class? You called it all, but you defined an instance method uh, all, and not a class method all. It got me. Sorry, that's a nuance, folks. We'll, we'll, <laughs> you'll learn about that later. But yeah, we're just trying to make it look like an active record thing, so we don't have to touch the database. Let me try that. Thank you for that, Bill. I was going to get stuck on that. Hey, look, we're back to that blank page. Okay, so what we have right now is a controller that seems to be loading up or calling this all and this array syntax, these square braces returns a list of things and there's one thing in it and it happens to have a username of T Mecklem and a message and, but it's not showing in the view. So we need to make sure that our view actually shows the thing that we wanna show. So back over here in this index, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do away with all the really nice things that it gives you. Um, when it generates the scaffold because I want to keep this as simple as I can. So I'm just going to generate a list. So an unordered list, start and a close. And then what I'm going to do is say, all right, this is a little bit of weird ERB syntax, but I'm going to say for each of the things in tweets, just like we saw before, give me a reference to each tweet as I go. And then as I have this reference for each tweet, let me just put out a little bit of information about it. So I'm going to ask for the tweet's username. And I'll probably just put the message in there as well. So I'll say tweet dot message. Okay. So this should say for each tweet that gets returned from tweet.all, 
spit out one little line that just says, here's the username and here's the message. So I'll save this and we'll just see what happens. Do you think it'll work? Thumbs up if you think it'll work. You are more confident than I am. Let's see what happens. Oh, it did work. You guys were right and I was wrong. I need a little more self-confidence, I guess. Um, so there we go. That's the model, the view, and the controller all working. And if we go look at the changes that we've made in our source control view, uh, which I always get wrong, there's only four files that we changed. And there aren't that many files. There aren't that many changes in each file. Um, we added the, the route, which at this point should seem somewhat familiar to you. We added the controller with an index method that just goes and fetches all the tweets from whatever tweet can do to go fetch it. So you saw in our case, we didn't even use a database. It could make a call to another service or some service on the internet or a database or multiple databases. That model is really separate from the rest of this. And so that model is where all of the really important heavy lifting stuff usually goes or part of that system where all the heavy lifting is. Um, and the controller isn't thinking about any of that. It's just saying, I'm expecting for there to be a tweet thing somewhere and for it to have an all method and to give me a list of stuff that I can show. And then when you get to the, the front end part of it where you're writing the HTML, it's really just iterating through each of those tweets that gets returned, assuming that there is a username and that there's a message on each one and showing it. And so just maybe to wrap up since we're a little bit over uh, and I, I wanna respect people's time, um, let me add one, just one more tweet to it just to kind of show you how it goes. Um, I'm inside of you. I have to use control. I'll just do this. Open struct that new username fill message. We did it. How about that? Comma yeah. after line four. Bill, do you uh, do you endorse this tweet? Um, I do. If you oh, you put the comma there. It's gotcha. there. I, yes, I was, yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> I was sneaky with it. I put it just past the columns. Yes, I do. <laughs> Post on my behalf. All right, and then I will refresh this, and you'll see two different lines, one for each one. All right, so we covered a whole lot of stuff that resulted in four changes to four files. However. There's a lot more behind the scenes that Rails does, and so those four changes were very powerful. Um, I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. I also want to respect that some people will have to get back to work, and so uh, I kind of want to end it at that point and, and then just kind of take questions for a little while if anybody has any. Um, so thank you for the presentation part and, and paying attention and joining, and I guess we'll know, go into a, like a Q&A kind of a thing now. So what do you got? 